Henderson, oh, it's 1 0 Blues! What a header that is! Christian Pedersen with a bullet header! It's then floated towards the back post, Jukovic in there, Jukovic! Oh, what a header! This man is on red hot form at St Andrews at the moment. And it goes again towards the towering Ziggich. Oh, confusion at Martin! And surely scores the winning goal for Birmingham City! Hello and welcome to the Blues Talk podcast, the second of the 2019-20 season. Dale Moon and Callum Denning back after a three-week break. But in those three weeks, we've seen yeah, a bit of a mixed bag of results. A couple of losses on the road, but a fantastic win here at St Andrews just this weekend. We'll be talking about that in more detail shortly. And we are joined by a man who knows all about firing his way to the top of the championship. It's Gary McSheffrey here. On Blues Talk. The Blues Talk podcast with Dale Moon and Callum Denning. All right, Dale, we're back and we've got four matches to talk about, which is almost unheard of for Blues Talk. It's been a mixed bag, it's probably fair to say, over the past few weeks. Let's start just after our most recent podcast. We um we travelled to Forest, we went to the city ground. Yeah, it just seems to be the contrast of home and away at the minute, doesn't it? We uh, Yeah, the, the home results aren't, sorry, are, are much better than... And the away ones uh, sort of can say it's to be expected right? or club bank on their home form being particularly good. And it seems to be the case for us in these early parts of the season. But yeah, we go to the city ground. Um, sort of su- surprised me the game actually, Forrest, that having seen them on the day, I actually think they'll be very strong this season. Just looking at the depth they've got, how athletic they were in the middle of the park. Um, they have a goal for it not just in Graver and Lolly as well. We know all about already stung us and burnt us a few times before. So we knew about their threats, but I'm, I was impressed by Forrest on the day. And we didn't, I think the, the goals that we conceded, how quickly they came as well, just took the game away from us, took our legs from, from underneath us. Um, and it was done and dusted really after the second second one in the third compounds things because of the manner of the goal. Um, so disappointing away day at, at Forest, but we might be sitting here in our very last podcast of this season and talking about how good Forest could have been this year. Because I were, well, I have to say, I come away impressed with with them rather than being too disappointed with ourselves. It was the case that they just, I mean, through no fault of Blue's own, really outplayed us at times. They were a top quality side, uh, and, and yet the, for the first fifteen minutes, we were the we were the side. Oh of the yeah, ascendancy. dominated them. Yeah, and so. Um, you know, I think we created one or two chances. I remember Gardner getting in a good position. Lukas Jukovic and Crowley were, were linking up, if I remember right. Um, I think managed to create any of those clear-cut goal-scoring opportunities. We were almost banking on half chances and openings rather than, than carving Forest open. I think the big challenge on that day um, was just having someone that could run Michael Dawson at you know, mid-30s, stiffer than he was 10 years ago. Uh, in his prime, uh, you want someone buzzing around those ankles of his and making him turn and run into areas that he don't like and pulling him each and every way. And they had quite an easy-ish afternoon in the sense that they could defend nice and high, knowing that we didn't have a player to run in behind. And and I think we'll allude to the fact that injuries had plagued sort of those sorts of players who would get us up the pitch. Jack Magoma, Jefferson Montero, the sorts of players you need to get us up the pitch in counter attack. And so it was an easiest afternoon for them defensively. Midfield-wise, they were athletic, but they used it well. And then little bits of quality and lax defending on our part uh, meant that it was a comfortable afternoon for Forrest, which is disappointing from our point of view. We'll touch on this a little bit more when we talk about the Swansea match in a moment. But let's not forget, this is a blue side that's in transition. It's still trying to find itself. We're playing a different style of football to that that we perhaps played last season under Gary Monk. But... Even at Forest, like you said, those opening 15 minutes, the early signs were promising. I think that's going to be the story of this early few few weeks and months of the season is that you'll see Blues in flashes, fits and spurts of the capabilities of what we can be. Uh, it's a case of trying to extend those minutes into 45 hours, 90 minute games where we're in full flow. And that might not happen for another few months, two seasons perhaps. You see us at our very best. Um, so at the minute we're having to just try and profit from those spells of 15-20 minutes make sure when we are on top we score the goals 
um, and the chances that we create. I think uh, that's going to be the biggest challenge when you have a team in its infancy with so many new players, not just to the club, but to the country and to the league itself. You, they get, you, you're going to expect those inconsistencies mm-hmm. married up with the fact that we've still got young players in the side as well. I mean, Villalba's young, Crowley's not old. Steve Seddon. Seddon, Harding. These aren't players that have played three, four, five seasons in the championship. So inconsistency, I think we can come to hope for. I know we, we don't take no uh, pride in saying it, but ultimately, I think when you consider all the factors involved, you can't expect Blues to be at their very, very best in August, September of a new season with so much um, change in the summer. Well, best thing about that was we had a chance for an instant rebuttal, a midweek home game against Barnsley on that Tuesday, and delivered it. Yeah, they did. Um, credit to them because you always want a response. You know, the players will come away from Forest, you know, annoyed, disappointed, frustrated. But um, to then bounce back very quickly on that Tuesday night at home in front of our home support, it just seems to we seem to have a different attitude, a different confidence about us when we're. We're at St Andrews. And um, although for 60 minutes, I mean, it was a bitty, horrible game. We couldn't get any momentum going. And Barnsley, of course, was scrapping for points. Got one of the youngest sides in the division. So lots of youthful exuberance and energy and hunger among them. They just lacked a little bit of quality on the ball. And that meant that we could then be the side in the second half that could push. And, you know, you look at certain games, and I think to, to what Kevin Broadhurst always mentions is that as a manager, on the 55-hour mark, you sometimes stand there in the te- technical area and when you're pondering changes, you think, right, before the game, I'd have settled for a point. I'm not saying that was the case in this Barnsley match, but there will be games this season where Blues will go away from home or come up against tough teams. And pre-game, in the back of Pep's mind, Paco's mind, a lot of supporters watching it would have thought, OK, I'll probably settle for a, a one all a nil nil here and get away with a point. But then as the game transpires, you reach 60 minutes, you think, they're there for the taking here. Um, and I just think... Um, I just think it's what Blues were looking to do against Barnsley. And Lukas Jukovic is just, I mean, in those positions, there is no better player, we keep saying it in this division, to hang a ball up to the back post. Uh, his goals have all carbon copies of each other at the minute. but Three this season. Well, at the end of the day, whilst it works, um, I mean, he, he he depends on that sort of service. And the, the, the big... Um, the big challenge for Blues is just to make sure the service is right because if it is, you know he's going to be there and yeah, heads heads us into the lead and uh, away we go. And I think that first goal is always crucial when you get the breakthrough and you feel like you're on top then. So, um, yeah, we, we put Barnsley away. I mean, if you don't feel sorry for teams because you'd imagine Barnsley would be down there scrapping this season just because they're a newly promoted side, very young and experienced side as well. But home game against a newly promoted side, you want to win and uh, thankfully we did. Switch on that Jimenez goal. We spoke about Jukies, but let's give Jimenez's goal a little bit of a focus because what a strike it was. Ball coming in from the left from mm. Steve Seddon. Mm. Great touch from Jimenez into the box. Deaf little chip over the keeper. It's what seals the three points. And what a way to mark your home debut. And then he enjoy it. I mean, you look at the response on his social media channels alone. He, he dined out on it for about seven days. Well, fair play to him. I'd have done the same. Yeah, I mean, it's just dream come true, isn't it? I mean, he yeah, slides to his knees in front of the tilt and but... Pleasing that both full-backs are involved in the goals. Wes Harding down yeah. one side for, for Lukas Jukovic and then Steve Seddon picks out just a phenomenal pass. You can see it's on. It's one of those where everyone in the stadium can see if he gets his head up, it's on. But then can he execute that pass? Um, and he gets it just inch perfect. Credit to, to Alvaro as well. I mean, his first touch is in front of him to keep it away from the defender who's making a recovery run. And then to, to lift it up and I think it's up and just to the side yeah. of the goalkeeper. Drops inside the post. Um, brilliant finish um, you know, you, you'd like to think that that would do his, him the world of confidence um, the world of good sorry because you know you're a new player in the country you want to get off and running as a striker you know you, how often do you hear stories of strikers who don't have great starts slow starts and they never really recover from it but didn't take him too long to register his first Blues goal and let's hope it's the first of many we can but hope right well that was uh, the first two games after our most recent podcast I think it's about time we give ourselves a little bit of a break here because we've got a bit more analysis to perform. We've got Swansea and we've got Stoke. So let's hand over to, again, not to put ourselves down too much, an actual expert. <laughs> a man who has been there and done it all. He got Blues promoted in 2007. One of Steve Bruce's many signings, as he'll touch upon, spent a good few years as well. And no strangers, of course, to our, our co-tenants at St Andrews this season, Coventry City. It is the one, the only... Gary McSheffrey. The Blues Talk Podcast. 
All right, Gary McSheffrey. What the hell are we doing? <laughs> Junction 29 off the M1. 29A. 29A. Let's get that yeah. clear now. So We've we made went, that mistake once. We went to 29, had a nice little what, passion fruit, and you had a iced Cookies tea. and cream type thing. Yeah. yeah, weird. And then you weren't anywhere to be seen. We got the wrong junction. We're here now. Good to have you with us again, but what are we doing up here, mate? Well, this is cu this is the virtually the halfway. Well, it's not so much the halfway point. You've had to come a bit further. Yeah, shop. So yeah, when I hit when I hit thirty, when I hit thirty one <laughs> years old, I kind of I went to play for Scunthorpe and uh, lived in Doncaster. Right. Uh, met a, met a partner, had a couple of kids, and I'm still there, and now I'm working there. So. So yeah, it's half hour for me straight from training and a bit longer yeah. for yourselves, isn't it? But, uh, <laughs> How'd you find the Grim North, mate? What's it like? What's it like up here? Um, it's as you go as you go a bit further into Yorkshire, it's it's all right. Yeah, yeah it's not too bad where I live. South Yorkshire's there's a lot of clubs around there, quite yeah, a lot yeah. going on. Yeah. Um, this is that middle ground. This is that grey area. So yeah, we've, yeah. we've come and met halfway. About <laughs> quite literally a grey area as well. Where we are at the, the moment, Derbyshire, the Derbyshire yeah. way. Um, but nah, it's all, it's all good, isn't it? Now you're in your Doncaster tracksuit, mate. Tell us a bit about what you're doing now, currently, like you say, living up here now and working with Doncaster Rovers. Yeah, so I kind of um, wanted to, didn't plan on retiring, to be honest. I just thought, oh, keep playing, keep playing and keep nicking the years. And that's what it got to in the end. It got mm. to, you're nicking years, like, and you're thinking, you comfortably, you can comfortably play at the level. You know, you've got a lot to offer, but the, the lower down, the, the lower down you went, you kind of, um, the, the clubs are the clubs I think they're, they're looking to, to have assets you know they're, they're always looking for that next one they're going to yeah. make money on yeah. ra rather than well should we get don't get me wrong there's quality in the squads but I think in these lower leagues once you hit 30 and above you you looked at it really as probably finished the you, yeah you're done you're done you're finished the odd few keep going and they've got the respect that they keep getting the year contracts but that's what it is it's year contracts yeah so. To be fair, you're always on your toes because you have to produce, you have to perform each season to earn the next contract. But it's almost like you look now in the in the champ and the prem, and you can you can have a bad two years and sign a new deal. Yeah. You know, it's it's a strange one. But um, so I was so I started coaching as I was I was training with a youth team to keep fit, and uh, they wanted me to join in and be the assistant youth team coach. So I started the role whilst I was looking for a club, and then club never come. Yeah, and uh, I'm still there, like about <laughs> six, probably about 16 months ago now. It was literally the beginning of last pre-season. Yeah, so 14, 15 months, um, and yes, yeah, so I've I've been with the youth team ever since. Um, the youth team are really developing now. They're doing you know doing quite well. We've got mm. some good players and really getting a bit of a you know a our DNA if you like yeah, of how yeah. we play. And, and yeah, and it's it's coming together really well. Um, but also, I've also just started taking over the 23s as well. So it's kind of like a dual role at the minute. Yeah, Still yeah. doing the 18s and the 18s match day, but also doing the 23s match day. So do you have aspirations of going to be first team manager, or are you just happy um, coaching for now and learning? And yeah, I, I've always said if if it happens in the future, it happens. At the minute, at the minute, it's not for me. I just want to yeah. I want to make sure I learn my new trade, if you like, yeah, and, yeah. and learn the ropes. And and if anything ever does happen, I need to be ready for it. Um, yeah. But at the same time, you start dipping your toes into first team level. You you're on that um, you're on that roller coaster again as a player, where you don't really know where you're going to live. Yeah, short term is. Yeah, it? it's a lot of it's short term and settled at the minute. The uh, you know we're we're expecting another baby. So Congratulations, mate. Thank you. So it's 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 nice to be in this role of development football if you like because it kind of gives you a bit of stability and yeah. you can you can plan a bit where you're living for the next few years and. That's definitely the the role I'm going down at the minute. I'm learning quite a lot at Doncaster. Some some parts good that's going to help me in the future football wise. Some parts off the pitch, like the things that I'm dealing with at the minute with uh, a 23s group that's not really a full squad. It's yeah. a it's a bit of an in between group. So some days you've got small numbers. Some days you have to join them in with the 18s. Um. So so some things I'm learning quite early yeah. of of you know how not to do things in a yeah, way as yeah. well. So yeah. um, hopefully it can all knit together, and in a few years I can, you know, be be a good coach Absolutely. in whatever it is I do. Yeah. Well, on the way up here, we were talking, me and Mikael, just about the timing of this chat with you today because Jude Bellingham at the weekend, as I'm sure you probably saw, became our youngest ever goal scorer. So after breaking Trevor Francis' record, our youngest ever player 
in the Carabao Cup, then to play in the league, and then to score for the club as well. 16 years and 63 days, I think yeah. it was. But you at one stage were one of the youngest players to play in the Premier League. I think you were 16 and 190 something days. Yeah. At Cobb. What's it like to be that young? The spotlight's on you and you're the golden kid for a little bit. And then we, obviously, mine's going back 20 years, isn't it? 21 yeah. years, 16 and 198 days it was. And uh, it was, I didn't see it as a, honestly, at, at the time it was all a bit surreal, yeah. crazy. I was for, I was having a good year in the youth team, you know, and I, I knew I was going onto the pitch and I knew I'd score goals, whatever game, whether it was reserve game, youth team game, yeah. first team, a couple, couple of in-house first team training games. I knew I'd go onto the pitch and score goals, mm. whatever the opposition. And uh, when you, you've got that confidence, but I was literally playing a youth cup game on the Friday night at Highfield Road and we I think we beat Sheffield United 4-0 and I got I was on I was on a hat trick and I got bought off after about an hour and I'm fuming I'm fuming <laughs> I'm thinking what's going on here I, I want the match ball and uh, to to the news of Richard Money and George Mackey my academy managers and youth team coach telling me that Gordon Strachan had pulled me off from the stands and I'm on the bench tomorrow at Aston Villa uh, for my Premier League debut and uh, yeah I got on we won 4-1 and it was it was a great day quite surreal and goes over your head a bit you, you don't yeah. really I didn't really get an opportunity to take it all in and I can only imagine now for Jude that it's it's crazy it must be crazy for him now because all, mm. with all the social media now I mean it, it was I had a don't get me wrong it was in the local paper and that yeah, the yeah. Coventry Telegraph and locally I was in the spotlight for a bit but it blows over right. um, but I can I can only imagine now it must be you have to be fair play to him I've seen how he I've seen how he conducts himself yeah. I've seen him speak in interviews and he seems the he seems the full package to be fair off the pitch yeah. I haven't seen too much of him on it I ain't going to lie but to be playing for Blues at that age you must have a bit and yeah. uh, I've seen some videos as, of him as coming through the academy as a kid and he looked he really looked the part but I'm really impressed with his interviews off the pitch and that and uh, for for someone so young to deal with the, the spotlight now mm. in, in the modern day you know fair play to him I take my hat off to him and yeah. Wish him, wish him a great career, because you know, one thing I would say to him, it goes, it, it does go like that, with a click yeah. of a finger. Yeah, amazing. He, um, like you say, maturity-wise, for 16, he's like well beyond his years. Mm. Like you say, you listen to his interviews, and at 16 to be saying just the way he delivers his interviews and Incredibly how thoughtful he is, yeah. and you know, the way he says things. Did you have that sort of maturity, or did you? How did you stay grounded? Because he seems a very grounded lad. But when you told how good you are. And anyone, everyone would have known that you were the next one to come through. Did you have that chip on your shoulder, or did you remain grounded? Did you have good family around you to keep you? Listen, I, I was always, I was always grounded, um, always approachable, or probably a bit, probably a little bit shy. And you? I was probably a little bit uneducated in, in that side of the game. Yeah. You know, it was all about football back then. And fair play now. You look at you look at the academies now and see what Christian's doing at Blues and stuff and. Uh, the syllabus, the 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 four corner yeah. work that, that they do now in the syllabus, psychology, tact, tech, physical things, mm -hmm. and uh, they are prepped. They're prepped well now. And if yeah. you if you're a good player and you're coming through the system, you you know the it, it's their role to really hand them over, being prepped, mm -hmm. not only on the pitch but being a well accomplished person as well. Yeah. And mm -hmm. and you can see they've done a great job of him. What was it like being from Cov and being that man? Do you remember it as a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, your mates around the place? Especially in a local derby as well, making your debut. Yeah, yeah, yeah Villa away, my, like my mates. We, we were going. I think we were going the game anyway. I think we had tickets as fans anyway. Yeah. So, so you missed out on well, your place in the away end. <laughs> I think someone had it. One of the lads. From the, one of the lads from the youth team had it. Sold or one, it, didn't or one of my family. Yeah. Tidy profit. I sold that. And I, got me, I got me two comps as well. Probably made a few quid from there. <laughs> but no, yeah, it was. As I say, it was. It was. Yeah, it was good. It was it was weird. Don't get me wrong. You enjoy it. You, you can't help but not enjoy it. Um, mm. Bit bit surreal at the time, um, especially with it being Premiership as well. Yeah, it was it was Premier League, so it wasn't a case of. I knew, I knew I was just dipping my toe in. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I knew that I was going to go back to the youth team, but yeah. enjoy it for what it was when you were there. Yeah, enjoy it for what it was, and then at the beginning of the next season, I got four or five more appearances under Strachan, and. Uh, but it was a strange one. I just knew that physically I weren't ready. Right. I was still a little kid. I was mm. still a little quick, little little boy really. Um, mm. In the youth team games, I was back then. I was quite sharp and rapid, yeah. and I knew I'd score goals. But 
physically physically when you're playing against the men especially yeah, like yeah. Premier League players you, you don't realise how robust they are yeah. until, you, until you come up against these fellas and, and even now if the game's gone on again it's, it's developed again and yeah. it's and it's we're in a new era of like a lot of, a lot of them Prem players now they're machines aren't they Just athletes you know they're athletes. athletes they've got big legs they've got no body fat on their upper yeah. body and they're just they're just really dedicated yeah. now and de- develop develop a lot better than than yeah. what we did in the past. Yeah, you played for England in the 18s and 20s. Yeah, any big names part of those groups? Do you remember any of did any of them go on to do anything? Yeah, lots, lots. We had um, the 18s group. We had um, we had Gareth Barry in the midfield with Joe Cole and Michael Carrick. Um, it's a great group. It's Grant a great midfield. Not bad company. Yeah. yeah. Great midfield. Um, Pruton, Pruton was in there. Yeah, now yeah. he's obviously big in Sky Sports. Yeah, yeah. Pruton was there when he was at Notts Forest. Um, we had, yeah, we had, we had a good group. You know, Defoe was in it. Jay Boffroyd. Oh, it's um, a great group, really. When yeah, you look back, they all went on to have good da- careers. Danny Weber. They yeah. all went on to. A lot of them went on to have good careers, and then at under twenties, it was the likes of Andy Johnson was there as well. AJ, AJ yeah. back in the day. Peter Crouch was involved. So yeah. there was there was lots of players. Chris Kirkland, Stephen Bywater, some good goalkeepers. And then they've I got, got a recruitment good England from yeah. that sort of group. None of them really they've all gone to have careers in the game. It's yeah, I mean and, and they've 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 really they've really invested now into the yeah. DNA of an England footballer and you yeah. know, the development from sixteens all the way up to first team, it's it's unreal when you, you look into what they've done now. Yeah. And uh but back then yeah, we, we always had good players, just just didn't quite just didn't quite jowl right, did it at first team level. But yeah. in the lower age which we were always, always good, decent. but again we didn't really win things but the names that come through to play top level football yeah. were were right up there. It's a great crop now. You look at like Foden, Sancho, you know, some of those the Chelsea lads, uh-huh. you know, some of the uh, Hudson Odoi, Mount. I mean, there's some players in that young age group now. You'd like to think in the next couple of tournaments, you, England have got a chance again. Gold yeah, they have. Like, like I say, there's, there's an era come through now. And there's a couple of country kids in it, Callum Wilson and James Madison. Yeah. And that that purple patch of era that Coventry have just had come through from the academy yeah. made some money for them five or six gone on to play international football yeah. and uh, that's that's just a club like Coventry so yeah, yeah. all them top clubs that are really pumping millions <laughs> into it you, you'd like to think that there's there's going to be some reward for it now and I think the the crop that's coming through and it's going to come through over probably the next 10-15 years can o- it can only be good for the country and the, mm. the national team let's talk about you going out on loan do you feel that benefited you when I was looking back over it? Stockport, Luton, out to Sweden as well. What were those experiences like? Sweden was Sweden was one because I'd, I'd had a couple of good years with Coventry in the youth team. I was a young pro, and then I had then I had, then I had that classic season of mm. injury. You know when your body starts growing a yeah, little yeah. bit, and I had a couple of operations, so I missed a lot of the season. So I went to Sweden on the during the summer because it's a summer season, isn't it? Yeah, and. Uh, it was all right. It was all right. At first, I was going to a place in Stockholm called Cafe Opera, and it was basically a football club, a stadium. The stadium had a casino, a nightclub, a hotel. Oh, that's lethal. So it had, it had, oh my it had dangerous a, combination. It had, it had the lot, and uh, <laughs> it was in Stockholm. So I, I was looking forward to it, thinking it was be a good experience. And then, last minute, there was a curveball. I, oh, no. I ended up in a place called uh, IK Braga in in a city called Borlanga in middle of Sweden right. and it's a big old country not a lot of people Yeah. and uh, every game was like seven, eight hour drive uh, co- coach journey real eye opener for me um, first time being away from home as well I got a bit homesick I'm not going to lie yeah. two and a, so I, I did two and a half months there and I come back I was begging really to come back Yeah. and uh, Gordon Strachan said no you're staying out there <laughs> you're, <laughs> there, you're there for a reason you're staying out there and about two weeks later my academy manager brought me back Richard Money brought me back and uh, it was brilliant because the, the first team had done I, I really only wanted to come back I wanted to, I didn't want to miss a day's pre-season mm. and uh, I come back about two weeks into pre-season and I hit the ground running and then Gordon Strachan was pleased that I come back and obviously I was fit and, and ready to go so it, that was that was the first one yeah. then Stockport was my first real professional one right. got my first career goal there under Colin Palmer, that was an experience. In <laughs> uh, yeah, that was it. That was championship. So Coventry were in the t- at the top end of the champ, and uh, Stockport were rock bottom. But I went there, played four or five games. Yeah, go get games. Um, 
And then the big one for me was Luton on loan. That was the big one. That put me back. That put me on the map really because I was on the map from a kid. Yeah. But then I had that couple of quiet years where I had injuries. I was playing reserve football. Yeah. And as I say, that's the difference now. The difference now is once you're in that spotlight now, you, you're in it because of all the social media and course, stuff. Yeah. But you can quickly go off the map, you know, if you if you're not involved. Yeah. And Luton put me back on the map massively. I think I got nine or ten goals in 18 games. Was, yeah, nine in 18. And uh, loved it. Played under Mike Newell, Mick Harford, Brian Steen. Rock was, hard, Mick Harford. Yeah, it was. They were a good group, good team, and uh, learned a lot. Very street streetwise group. Taught me a lot of things. You I think know, like, players need that. Chefs. I do. I think. I think what they're missing out on at the minute. I think what a lot of them are missing out on on the minute is that that nous and that streetwise and that's probably yeah, yeah. because they're a bit spoon fed yeah and uh definitely at my place now for example doncaster some some of the some of the youngsters there yeah they just i just so, I, you can't really buy that now or that streetwise can you i think it's I think in 23 yet. is as well as competitive you, as it i is. think it's in yeah it's how you bought up it's probably home life even yeah, to a yeah. degree so yeah, yeah. back then that Luton team really had that in abundance mm. and uh I, yeah that that as I say that that got the ball rolling for me massively because yeah. I went back, went back to Coventry and scored twelve and in the second half of the Eric season. Black, Eric Black chucked me and because uh, me and Julian Jones we were in the bomb squad at the start of the season under yeah. Gary McAllister. He just right. I had two years left on my contract, but surplus to requirements. He put eight of us on the transfer list right. and uh, for, for whatever reason, yeah. I mean, he, he was he was having me because when I was in the youth team, he was playing and he was in his last year. And he loved our youth team, you know. We got to two youth cup finals and yeah. he was buzzing off us all. He come back as manager, so straight away I was in the team and I scored eight for him that season. By I scored eight by October. And then I had a quiet second half of the year and didn't really score. And that's when he decided to trans put me on the transfer list, said going forward you're not gonna play and fair enough, I didn't even have an agent. So then uh the the next season the Luton one came about and uh I got I come back and Gary McAllister had to retire because of his his wife was poorly, yeah. <laughs> and uh, Eric Black, Eric Black, you know he, he he was he was in charge then, and he chucked me and Julian Jochum up top, and uh, we were both in the bomb squad at the start of the season. Amazing how it can change, though, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. You know if you fancied or not. And I scored change? I scored twelve. He got eleven <laughs> in eight, in eighteen again. It's a great guy, bad combination. And that but was when you think though, you were in a but two of you were both in the bomb squad at the start of the season. It's only because there's an unfortunate set of circumstances. I mean, the manager changes. Your timing's perfect to go in. He shows a bit of faith in you, and then you both end up bagging twenty three goals between you. Yeah. Timing's just some things yeah. you can't control yeah. as a young player, and it just happened for you. Joe, he, he was a great fella, great, unbelievable fella. You couldn't break him. You couldn't could not break him. <laughs> Try and he, snap him. And he was can't. in that bomb squad and uh, training on his own. Just literally jogging around the pitches for an hour and fifteen. Er Eric Black used to get a bit embarrassed, you know, yeah. telling him what he was doing for the day because he'd say, "Blacky, what?" The joke he's had got a bit of a list, so he'd be like, "Blacky, what am I doing today, son?" <laughs> and they'd be like, "Jules, I think you know what you're doing, son. <laughs> oh, how no. many how many laps do you think you can get in today?" And he went, "Oh, I'll give it. I'll try and get a hundred in today." And, and he'd just trot around that pitch Fair and he'd be like, "And like you say." It w he got he got back in in the yeah. end because he didn't kick off. He weren't he weren't a bad apple around the place and uh, I f it was funny because on on ten we we're on a goal bonus goal bonus back then on ten goals yeah. and uh, I'm on nine. Jo Joach has already got ten and he goes on a, he goes on. A, I remember going on a maze at Highfield Road and you could give him the ball and he just breezed past defenders and he got he got he ran from the halfway line, beat a few men, got into the box and got fouled. And he had the ball in his hand and he went, are you on nine goals, son? <laughs> I says, I am. He went, tell you what, you pop this penny and I'll have a grand. I'll have a bag of thunder. Your, <laughs> your, <laughs> give me a grand of your bonus. Did he get a grand? He didn't get a grand. He just, <laughs> he just got a top man. Yeah, cheers, mate. But, uh, play to him. but no, it was good. But yeah, <laughs> funny things that happened. And that was, that was the big loan for me, yeah, that put me on the map. Yeah. And then I went, went on to have three solid seasons at Coventry, really, really good seasons at Coventry in the champ. And that's when I come to Blues. Yeah, I was saying the first one back with Cobb, he scored 17 goals, but you got 11 yellows that season. Do you have a temper on you? Were you just an awful tackler? Or she used to How were you picking she up? Used to whip the shirt off, didn't they? <laughs> <laughs> Every goal. <laughs> no, no, they they started getting um, this. I think I got five pens. I got five in that in that run of 17. I got five consecutive home penalties. I think it's still a record. Right. And um. At high, 
and it, honestly, I'm not being funny. They started thinking, oh, he's, he's just winning pens rather than, and I was getting buried. I was getting fouled, yeah, mate. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, they started trying to like pull me for diving then. And I think I got about three or four for diving that were right. stonewall penalties, right. unbelievable. But it was just almost like this lad's winning too many penalties. Kind of but I weren't so much winning though. I was You're getting clattered. I was getting yeah. clattered, yeah, by <laughs> yeah. some old school defenders back then. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's a few late tackles, a few probably shirts off when you celebrate but a few a few of her like diving and that and that i've probably dived a couple of times in my, in <laughs> my career to, yeah you gotta get some footage there was, a couple, yeah, there was a couple yeah uh you played the first three games for cov in the 06 07 season right at the start of that year when did you hear that blues were interested how did that call, all come about i'd already heard i'd heard in um we was in portland with coventry yeah we did pre-season tour in portland and i think it was utah something like that a week in each and um, Mickey Mickey Adams was my manager and he, he pulled me one day and he just went Mickey was funny he just straight to the point I've had that f- Steve Bruce on the phone today <laughs> said, I said yeah what, what Steve Bruce what Birmingham manager yeah f- wants to buy you for a million pound told him to F off <laughs> I said decent he went you don't want to leave do you I went no, I don't want to leave. I, I didn't, honestly. And you didn't. And back then it weren't about, nowadays you, people chase Jumping. moves, don't yeah. they? Yeah. Yeah. Score five goals, they want to move. Yeah, yeah. But it, honestly, I, I didn't even, didn't see me leaving Cov at all, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. And uh, it, it kept going on and it kept going on. And maybe it it might have even been while we were still in America. He's pulled me again and gone, he's, he's, he's rang up again, up, up the offer to like 1.5 or something. And I'm, I'm going, look, well, I, I don't rush. know. I don't know what the crack is. So, mm. all I'm saying is, uh, my head's on staying here. And that was the first time there was ever really speculation on me right. me moving anywhere. And uh, so it, it went on for about a month. Went on for about a month. Like you say, I played three for Coventry. Um, head was in it though. Head was on the yeah, game. Yeah, my head was in it. I mean, I scored the winner in the first game at, against Sunderland at the Rico. Um, and then we played Southampton away, I think, and Cardiff away. And I think literally my second Blues game was back to Cardiff <laughs> right. and lost both games. <laughs> <laughs> lost both. But yeah, no, disp- so it went on for about a, a month and uh, eventually the bids kept go- going up and it was what it was. And then as it then as it gets closer and closer and then you actually have a chat with Steve Bruce and you hear the dog. You, 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 you actually know that someone of his calibre really wants you and that you're his, you're his main, yeah. you're his main um, target. And then, the, yeah, then they talk the dough and it's like tripling your money. You, you just think, well, Why hold on a minute. And then to be fair to Coventry, they they were still digging deep, digging their heels in and said, look, we'll we'll try and match the money. And I was like, well, well, if you do, well, if you do, then going really champ to champ for me, I looked at it at the, at the time, I looked at it as a bit of a sideways Sorry. movement. Yeah, yeah. Although Blues had just come down, but then Mickey Allen's basically pulled me he said look if you want to go you're going to have to put a transfer request in we ain't the club can say what they want but they're not going to af- afford to pay you that money yeah. and I said look Mickey I can't I've got to live here mate I'm, yeah. I'm from here yeah. I'm, it's my hometown club I'm not putting a transfer request in I don't even want to leave yeah. the club want the money for me I know the club want the money for so me they, if they want to sell me yeah. sell me but if, if, if you could nip it in the bud if you want but yeah. you just keep just wanting more money mm. I said so you know, you need to you need to be honest with with the fans and that. And mm. we'll, I'll I'll happily say it's a mutual thing mm. because I can't turn this opportunity down. When yeah. I looked at the blue squad, when when I got there, and I thought uh, that first two de- first days training, yeah. and I've I've I've, I've got out the there, ball. I've got out there, and then um, Eric Black's putting a passing drill on, and David Dunn's fizzing balls into me, <laughs> and I'm like, this is the standard, this is the tempo, and like Bruno and Gotti is just lighting his cigar and that <laughs> but but just classing everything he does the yeah. Jai- Jaidis of this world they'd yeah, just yeah. come back from like World Cups mm. playing for Tunisia and, and got it was obviously a French legend Yeah. and I'm looking thinking this is a squad this Clements big big tiny Taylor uh, Matty Upson Cam Jerome there as well Cam, Cam had just come Neil Dans had just come Some so it there. was it was a summer where basically Bruce probably got rid of about 15 and signed maybe 10 11 English players like good English jam. yeah good Quality. good yeah ready for the level and uh 
just just went into that group like a duck to water honestly just yeah. felt part of it and hit the ground running didn't score for a while but i know my, my performance levels were up there yeah and we were all just at it and, and any sign the three from our no the three from arsenal were already there as well yeah last and bent now so it was Re really group. good blend good group yeah the experience was the experienced players were unbelievable mike taylor yeah got on with them all great i was addressing right, right like some start. jokers in there some big characters in there yeah it was it, it was it was good we had um there was some yeah there was some characters but there was such good pros in there yeah well, i remember we went five without a win and bruce's job was on the line a bit mm. i think we lost to norwich at home yeah. and, and the next day he really had a really had a pull clear the air meeting and pulled everyone and basically said to everyone up listen i thought you's all in here you's all on good money made you's all a quite wealthy men start giving a bit back now and from that day we went i think that was when we went 13 and beat them i, read. I think 10 or 10 or 11 and there might have been wins yeah and Steve Clements really was the one that pulled us, started it off. Because I remember, I remember there was a League Cup game. I don't think I was involved in it. And Bruce had a pop at Clements at half time once and basically called him a few words and said, You're ducking out of challenges. And Just dug him out. Yeah, dug him out a bit. And it might have, you never know, it might have been a plan because you look, Bruce, Clem's gone everywhere with Bruce, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah. As his coach. He likes so, it, he has it, he's having him, yeah. And he, he was, that, day, that year for me was he's up there with the best players I've played with and he yeah. got player of the year that year deservedly so but I remember that night I remember that and I remember Clem giving her a bit back you know gutted and disappointed that he he sort of said he'd duck yeah. out of a tackle or out of a header it's a slight in your character that isn't it it is yeah and and you could see that he he, react, he responded in the right way and yeah. honestly led led the lads what a captain he was you know and just, just set an example on the pitch that yeah. you could only follow and just just raise your own game for because of that yeah, yeah. I'd have sulked I think yeah. the manager just pointed me Some out top in the corner yeah. he definitely he had a sulk for a bit <laughs> yeah, he had a sulk for a bit but any manager ever, ever come at you during your career anywhere yeah yeah a good few that's probably been my downfall like. <laughs> <laughs> that's probably my downfall like I've seen what for though I've seen people just take things and just deal with it and just be so easy to get on with and they just keep getting them two year contracts <laughs> because they're so easy keep the mouth shut they're yeah. so easy to get along with and yeah. I think if I didn't agree with something, I was always kind of one to just stick up for myself a bit or, yeah, yeah. or ask why or debate it a bit. I don't ever think it was in a... I don't really think it was in the wrong way. I just think I always kind of had... Yeah, that's probably my downfall. Should have probably just piped There's down. There's quality to it, though. There's quality yeah. to that, though, having a strong enough player to go back at someone if you don't feel like it's right. It's well, probably gets your respect as well if you stand up for yourself. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, one year contract. There was, yeah, <laughs> yeah. There was a couple of times, though. I mean, there was there was one occasion when I we went to Chef U, I think. Is it Blues? With Blues, with McLeish and Roy Aitken and them, and uh, we lost two one at Bramall Lane. I think it was the third. I think it was we'd, we'd gone up my my third season, so it was back yeah. in the champ. Yeah, gone yeah. up again that year, but it was we were falling into a little bit of a poor performances again and kind of like asking the players what's going on what's going what could you be, what could you be doing better and I remember sort of saying well I think we all need to have a little look at ourselves in the mirror are we all doing enough and I think that that finished me really yeah. that finished me because yeah. I think I was flagging something up that quite a lot of players wanted to say you the one that said it but looking back now just just keep your mouth just shut keep your head down and get on with it get that two year and, and I look back now and I think you know, you, you're kind of you kind of always look for a bit of an excuse, but you're looking. If I looked in the mirror now and that third season, for example, I I was in, I had bad injury, but when I did play, I was performing such poor, poor standard mm. that there was no surprise like McLeish weren't playing me that year. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And yeah. that, it takes you to grow up a bit to, to be a bit more humble and suck it in and go. You know what? Especially now coaching and you see the con the dip in the form or consistency levels of players. You look back and say, "Yeah, you know, I wasn't good enough then," yeah. and you're probably always just looking for an excuse. Yeah. One of the memorable games from that little era was that Newcastle win in the cup, FA Cup, five-one. Yeah. Do you remember that one? Because that was quite yeah, a, I do, that's yeah. a big old win. That one. Yeah, it was great. It was. Um, we just scraped the draw at home, didn't we? Yeah. Seb Larson with a last-minute equaliser, uh -huh. I think. Got the replay, and yeah, Bruce. You could tell, you could tell with the gaffer when when he was really up for something. You could tell, and uh, yeah. he was going back home, wasn't he? Back yeah, up to Newcastle, it. and he was really, 
you're really getting the boys up for this one. Yeah. You could tell he wanted to win it. And uh, that's when Bruce really earned his money, you know. You know, in that changing room from about quarter to three onwards or if it, if it was a night game, we to get the that players. ten minutes before kick-off. What was he like? Was he, was he a motivational talker or did he just give one or two a nudge? Or? Motivational, he's... he's um, the firmness of his voice, right. the tempo he talk at, you knew he weren't messing about yeah. and you knew it was time to work and whatever's gone on in the week meant nothing if you don't go and perform now for the fans. A lot of it was always aimed at the pundits, you know. Yeah. In a, in a city like Birmingham, very workmanlike, they've worked their socks off all week, they get yeah, their yeah. money, they want to come to St Andrews and get entertained and let's go and put a show on for them and that, you know, and, and give them everything, work hard basically, yeah. give 100% and... He, he was top draw for me in that in that side of things. That connect, the connection between those teams, you know, from the promotion season but before yeah. that, all the way through, between the fans, you felt like that the atmosphere at St Andrews, it was rammed. Yeah, electric. That Sheffield yeah, Wednesday proper, game, the last home game that season. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there was one where we should have won the league and finished second because we didn't. Was that a Preston North End one? Yeah, yeah that was it. I missed Preston. two headers. Two so, you guilty? Was it? Yeah, I missed two sitters that day. Did you? Yeah, so we end up going up and did that go away after that? Did they ever go, did you ever go away as a group? Um, in the off season, or did you go and that, do your no, family? That, family? That, group, that group didn't go away that year. No, um, I think two or three probably went on a little lads' holiday, but we didn't actually have a. It was a strange one because we got promoted on the Sunday when yeah, yeah. when Derby, Derby lost to Palace. Palace yeah. yeah, Derby lost to Palace, so we were all at home. So a few of us met up. We went back to West Hills on the the Monday. Um, Gaffer like just basically called off training, and he had two big Lucas Aid cooler cooler boxes full yeah. of beer, and we had a few drinks, and then we went to the the boot in Latworth, is it, for yeah. a few drinks, and uh, yeah, we celebrated, and we we didn't train really properly till the Thursday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, went to Preston on the Sunday. Again, we should have won comfortably, but I I don't know how I've missed them two headers. You know, yeah. they they haunted me for a while then, and uh, I still see them now. <laughs> <laughs> what was important we got over the line but it's <laughs> always nice to have the winner's medal isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> but going back to that uh, Newcastle night yeah that was a big game yeah. the FA Cup Real, felt, felt everything like come together we absolutely and just that team, played through them we cut through them it, it wasn't a Newcastle team that were weak good no, team no. Milner, Solano, Dyer, yeah. Solano Michael Shea Gibbon in goal they were prop, they went full yeah. strength for Newcastle yeah, yeah we, we absolutely cut through them with some of the goals playing through the thirds just, yeah, yeah. just breaking lines it was DJ Campbell was on DJ fire that night on top Cameron was on fire first half. Just yeah. all come together, didn't it? it? Even Bruno put one in the top. <laughs> end, <didn't laughs> he did, stanch yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> Strike. Fair play to him. Then that season you go up, a few more players come in. I think Capo, got Parnaby, the Ridder comes in. He changes it a little bit, tries to get those flair players in the team. It's a t- tough go in that Premier League season. Yeah, I think I think I think he'd got everything right the season before in in the uh, in the recruitment. Mm. And then it almost looked like you go back to the oh well I can't trust I, I don't yeah. think these are going to be good enough so yeah. we need some foreigners in again and yeah. don't get me wrong Capo was good started the season really Smash well one in at yeah. Stanford Bridge, isn't he? yeah the uh, had actually just played like a 21s. under 21s tournament for for the Holland and yeah. I remember watching it thinking this Derrida kid's a good player <laughs> so do I and then he turns <laughs> up at sent, he turns up at what was still training ground and I'm like bloody hell I better lie up here <laughs> <laughs> he'll want my he'll want my shirt and you could see in training he had the lot yeah. It, I think he had one good game at St Andrews. He had a really good first half, and Bruce he got a bit g- giddy and started yeah. calling him gigs, didn't he? Yeah. And uh, but no, it was a strange. Dan was one of them. He gigs. <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> talent, but didn't quite do it at Blues, no, did he? You yeah, know, no. one or two flashes of brilliance, but couldn't get that consistency. And then when Alex McLeish came in, I think that was his time done as well because yeah. I don't think he could rely on him defensively. You know, as a team player really he was more of a flair yeah, player he wasn't was he? luxury player really mm. wasn't he? like you said though the impression of like not being trusted it was basically a new team wasn't it going into that it Premier was, League again it, it was like a rebuild again yeah. O'Connor, Gary O'Connor sold, yeah, Gary O'Connor. sold Clem to Leicester yeah. uh-huh. TFU left Dan's um, went after getting player of the year Campbell. Campbell Viney come and went there was yeah. there was a few there was a few and um, I remember he signed Rafa Schmitz didn't he yeah, yeah. Um, there was probably three or four good ones and probably I reckon four or five yeah poor not not good not good mm-hmm. you're just getting numbers in again yeah. and they're all coming in on probably pretty decent money also that, I, I, like, dressing room? I think Quidry was a good one Quid, yeah. Quidry great was character, great really? lad yeah, yeah good yeah. for the dressing room good, yeah. lovely fella I got on great with him you saw his yeah. own goal you saw his own goal oh, in Turkey Mar. have you seen it no is it, Fran- it. is it France I think Turkey. it was in France smashes one 
he's on the halfway line. He's trying to just clear it. Smashes one and shanks it. The keeper's back pedaling. It's bounced in the goal and got the it? best own goal. If you get a chance to watch it, go and check it out. I'll, I'll Google it. I will. Yeah, I'll Google have a it. Yeah. But yeah, it was all changed when it that season. Then Carson Young takes over. Okay. You at the club then? During the ownership change. So I so the the final my final season, I left in January and I went on loan to Leeds. Um, 2010, January 2010. So I don't think I remember speaking to Karen Brady. She sort she sorted the loan out, so right. I'm not sure. Yeah, she hadn't the moved takeover on by hadn't that time. Had, it hadn't happened then, had it? Yeah, yeah. No. Um, they had they yeah. McFadden in Zarati yeah. that January. Mc, McFadden had already come in. Mc, yeah. McFadden actually come in the January. McLeish took over. McLeish right, yeah. took over in probably what the November, October, yeah. November. And then this was January. McFadden come in for that five January, and a half yeah. mil that Jan because right. he just he been, was good, he was good for he'd just been scoring so. a few for Scotland, hadn't he? Yeah. yeah. And um, yeah, so so you know, Alec. Alice McLeish signed some good players. Barry Ferguson was great, I thought, for the club. He was so, yeah. so good at. He'd done the simple things so, so good yeah. that would go unnoticed, but wouldn't. You know, for example, you take it for granted when you win the ball back, keeping that first pass. The amount of times you see giving the ball away again on yeah. the first pass by trying to do something, yeah. Fergie just kept it so simple and it was so crisp in them 10, 15 yard passes that. He had to get the ball away. Without putting too much pressure on him, there's a lot of hope that that's what Ivan Sunic yeah. can be for us. They, a yeah. lot of fans are saying, the Barry stylistically, Ferguson although he hasn't gone to achieve as much as yet as yeah. Barry Ferguson, stylistically, he's got the rat in him to go and win it back, but yeah. then he's got the, the coolness to try and keep it. Finesse. So the hope is that... No, that, w- that would be good, because you know, the last couple of seasons, they've, they've always had tidy centre mids, but I, I think they've gone too far of just having sitters, haven't they? And mm. tidy sitters mm. rather than a bit of ball players playmakers in there but they seem to have got the balance okay with the so recruitment yeah, this year Pep's brought in a couple Fran of Spanish Bilal, lads Crowley, up all right. Dan Crowley's a, a player who will get Dan's one of them he's a cov kid and seen Dan from about 14 and uh, he was at Villa back then yeah. and he was one of them he was he was the boy he was the one that was, he was better than the Madisons yeah. of all of this world and went to Arsenal you just you just hope that he fulfills that potential because I've played against him a couple of times when he had a loan spell at Barnsley. You can see his feet; uh, he's got magic the yellow feet. Yellow cards. You got probably got a yellow trying to get magic near feet. Him. Yeah, <laughs> wanted, he, he wanted me shirt. After <laughs> 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 no, I'm only kidding. But no, he, hopefully he can fulfill that potential because he's he's some player. But yeah. it's one of them. We go back to the consistency side of things. Mm. Can't just be some player but turn up one every four. Yeah, you've got to be some player. Yeah, two, two, three seasons <laughs> now to really establish yourself. Yeah, changed the game on Saturday, didn't he? When he yeah, came he on, did. yeah, kind yeah. of an introduction. Yeah, he, he had twenty minutes, twenty-five minutes, and really got us playing. Ended up yeah. winning the game, so it's good. No, he's, he's um, good. He, that's what he can bring. That's what he can bring. You just got to hope that they can rely on him from the start. Yeah, to do the other side of the game, you know. Yeah. Promotion from League One with Leeds. When that club get going, they're one hell of a club, aren't they? Yeah, that's. I mean, that's why I went. I went. I went in the January and. Uh, <laughs> you ask all my teammates at Blues were like what are you doing what are you doing I, I says well I'm not playing here I need games they said yeah but you, you're sitting on the bench in the Prem you know it's not like you're not playing in the Champ or League mm-hmm. well, you, you're sitting on the bench in the Prem and I was thinking yeah but I need to go and play someone like Leeds want you yeah? yeah. come calling if I go there and have a, de- have a decent loan we get promotion to the Champ then I'll go there on a permanent but yeah. I think I'd have probably got a permanent in the summer anyway regardless and mm-hmm. Looking back now, would I have went there? I think I'd have rode it out till the summer and stayed at Blues and just hopefully nicked a few appearances here and there. Yeah. And just, you know, because I was training well all the time at Birmingham. That's one thing no one could say against me. But what you become, you become a bit of a training ground player, right? Because you're not playing the games on the Saturday. You, you're training great all week, but regardless, you're not playing. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a bit frustrating. Um, I wanted to just go and play games. I, I went and played nine or ten on the spin. I got an injury and then missed two and then sat on the bench for the last nine so yeah. it was it's a strange one a strange yeah, loan again I was going I was going to Leeds on the back of probably not playing great for Blues or or regular yeah so to just flick that switch on again didn't was, see the best of you was difficult no 100%, 100% yeah. honestly nowhere near didn't yeah. see 50% of me yeah a couple of flashes of good games but when I'm going to teams like that in League One and even going back to Coventry they're, they're expecting the same player to come back that 
that left four years ago. Yeah. And one thing I'd say about Blues, for two years, yeah, I was that player. Yeah. I felt like I could still do whatever on the pitch. But then two years under, under Alex, it was kind of like, I went back a better team player and I understood the why, I think I understood left midfield to a, to a T. Yeah. And I became a really good team player, but lost that individual flair. And you Spot. know, you know that selfishness of just, no, oh, I'm getting, I'm getting a goal or yeah, two yeah, today, no yeah. matter what. Yeah. And because of my previous goal scoring records, I think I was always judged on goals. Yeah, yeah. Once you stop, but you look, you look at lads now in the prem getting two goals and then signing a three-year deal and that, you know. England and they've got, ups, they've yeah. got two, they've got two in the last thirty appearances, and I'm thinking it's crazy how the Man. pressures change and the times change a yeah. little bit you, were, you just you just popped up too soon didn't you? Know, 10 years later you'd have been well may, yeah maybe but listen going back to what I said earlier when you actually when you actually sit back and you look you look back of what you what you've done and reflect a bit mm. I wasn't good enough under Alex McLeish mm. and the the rebound the domino effect of that I wasn't good enough at Leeds when I went there yeah. two, two big clubs in the spotlight and um, it's only even, I went back to Coventry like I say as a more accomplished player yeah, yeah. a good team player but they wanted me to score 15-20 goals every season it's tough when they remember you because you've left as that goal yeah. scorer at a young kid to then go back it is I, was, I mean I was still getting 8 and 9 <coughs> but it was I was doing a job for the team and, and yeah. I'd come off thinking yeah I've, I've played well there I know blah 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 but you get fit people thinking, well, you haven't even, you've, you've only had two attempts at goal. I'm like, I know, but not really that, not really that guy anymore. Yeah, yeah. I wish I was, but it's not me. I, I'm a better team player now. And I only really, I think looking back now, didn't enjoy it for about two, three years. Yeah. And I only found, I only found my love back when I went to Scunthorpe. Yeah. Honestly, I just started playing like. You were playing again. You racked up more appearances there, didn't you? Started yeah. Playing again. Appearances, assists. Paddy Madden with goal. you. Goals. Yeah, me and Paddy. It was good. We we lived together, me and Paddy, because I was only. We were renting and I was uh, travelling up a couple of times a week. Just started enjoying it again, played with a freedom. Yeah. And it was like the lowest money I'd ever earned, the lowest attendances I'd ever played in front of. Mm. But just that, getting my getting the joy back for football yeah, yeah. Was, was, was great. And like I say, I've, that was at about 30, 31. And just played solid five seasons then in League That's One and a couple in League Two. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I look back and I think there's a few things I'd probably change in my career. To, to stay at the level I wanted to play at, but it wouldn't it wouldn't have got me the family I've got now. So there's there's that like balancing act, isn't yeah, there? Yeah. So I, do I do I regret anything? Not really, because I've got a nice family out of Absolutely. it all. The path it's took me down. I look back now, and I can't, you can't be bitter in this and that because you you hear so many ex players, oh. don't you? But I'm I actually sit there and go, no, you know that for that for that spell, I was Very I was good. bang average yeah, yeah. for for the. For, there were spells when I was really good really good and I wish I could have kept that performance level up but for whatever reason it, it, it didn't happen and then I had to be better yeah. and, and ultimately uh, I started dropping down the leagues but I found my enjoyment again when I started dropping down the leagues Do you think that's you know players get levelled at them all the time where you hear like oh he's earning X amount a week sometimes it ain't about how much money they're on because if they ain't happy playing their foot and they ain't playing their football enjoyment. no amount of dough they'll be picking up at the end of a week can make them any happier yeah. no that it, make, that it, yeah 100 percent. at the end of the day everybody wants to be loved and rated especially by the mat the main man that picks the team and yeah. somewhat one or two people's opinions can can affect your career and affect your work mm. yeah you're still getting the money so you can still go and buy nice clothes on a a car or whatever but yeah. nothing change nothing beats that buzz of running out on a pitch and scoring a goal yeah. nothing i don't care what anyone says you don't get that adrenaline from anywhere else no. Well, I've I've never I've never found any adrenaline from anything else apart from out on the football pitch scoring yeah. goals. It's it's un it's uncomparable. And that's why you started playing the game. Of course, it really is. Yeah. Get the bug. yeah, yeah. The riches that come with it's great, but the, ultimately, no matter what level you end up playing at, you started playing that game as a boy or a young lad, however it was, because you just love the game and the buzz that you got from it. So, I don't think it matters sometimes how much money that, that these lads make. If they're unhappy and they're not playing, you best go out and play. Just go you and are, play you are, and, and that's what I try to tell that to my boys now and. Um, just say even if it's even if it's at levels of like either stick National yeah, yeah. League North you've you got to go and play the games and although that ain't where you want your career to pan out that's that's the starting point yeah. that's where you've got to start and mm. even Blues Blues 23 Blues players will be going to them types of leagues won't they yeah, and, yeah. and getting match experience so you can't be too um, 
arrogant and big-headed to, to drop to them levels to yeah. go and get games. And, and as I say, as I started dropping the levels at, and earned the less money I'd ever earn, I mean, I earned more money at 17 at Coventry on my first pro contract. Yeah. And uh, But I started enjoying football again. Yeah. And luckily, the last I had a good three or four year spell where I really enjoyed it. And then the last two again, I got an injury, medial ligament, and really that finished me at competitive yeah. level because I'd missed too long. I missed nine months with a medial uh, ligament injury, and uh, then I then I knew really that yeah. I'm getting I'm getting to that age where you're getting offered a year, but that's only if you've played 35, 40 games the season before. Yeah, that's it. So I knew that 10 games a season before weren't really going to cut and it. And on so. paper, clubs are looking at you thinking he's mid 30s, he's just come off the back of nine months of a serious knee. What, what are we going to get? What are we going to get out that's, of Yeah, that's what they are. That's what they are. And, and like I say, at, at these levels as well, you always want that that prospect that's going to make the club money. Yeah. So they always go with them younger ones that you're not always so. going to get consistency out of, but it's, it's a... It's the business plan of it, isn't it? And yeah. I can see, I can see why they do it. Still keep yourself in good nick, though. Just have a kick around every so often, or not? It's now fully coaching. Well, I am. Um, bit of power I, league on a night. No, I had a couple of games at the end of last season, and I was supposed to play in the charity game at St Andrews. Yeah. But I got, I played a game for Scunthorpe the night before. Yeah. And I got buried. <laughs> I was, I'd scored two great goals early doors. Oh, I got that one. And in some there. lad absolutely, <laughs> some lad absolutely buried me, and done, done my medial. No. And uh, so I had to miss that game. I played another game though a couple of weeks later. I shouldn't have played it. It was um, at Doncaster versus Leeds. So I played for the Leeds team that night. And uh, it's still bugging me. It's still bugging me now. But <laughs> I'm supposed to be getting my boots back on for uh, oh, no. an over 35 team on a Sunday. <laughs> right, and okay. and a couple of weeks we've got Monica Starr. Right. All the Blues. Yeah, they do all the ex-Blues players. few ex-Blues yeah, players yeah. there, don't they? Yeah. Devlin, Carlos. They're going to mess around. Yeah. You could get buried again. Yeah. Lee Andrew <laughs> plays. Yeah. So I'm supposed to be supposed to be getting fit for that, but knee's not in a great place to be honest. Yeah. But now I get done for diver. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Yeah. But um, no, I still, I still, yeah, still try and keep myself fit. Obviously, it's nothing beats football fitness of playing every week week in, week out. But you know, you've got to try and look after yourself for as long as you can, and yeah. Yeah. I want to throw some names at you to finish. Uh, One word or phrase that comes to mind from these players you've played with or against. Lukas Jukovic. What was he like? Right, I'll give you a sentence or two. Uh, Duke was a great lad. Um, in the Cov days, he was a bit greedy. But as a, as he's got older now, you can see he releases the ball at the right time now, and he's a great target man. Brings players into the game. Yeah. But but great great lad off the pitch. Match dual record: five successive goals at home on the spin. Yeah, decent. No, he's, he's done. I, I remember tweeting: Blues fans would love him because yeah. he just works his socks yeah, off, and he's yeah. got that physical Sleep, presence he's everything that he's just but as he's got older he's got that he's got it into him where he releases the ball at the right time and brings them players into play you know yeah. like Covey was a <laughs> little bit greedy at times yeah. uh, Richard Keogh Keogh great that again uh, just loves the, loves the eyes doesn't he loves the <laughs> pass for the eyes that, that one loves the Jager bomb Coppinger <laughs> uh, Cops, yeah, Cops is good, mate. Cops is, uh, he's, he's in his, what's he in now? 15th? He's still going. 15th season? 16th season. Up there, yeah. 16th season. <laughs> yeah. And he's just scored already as well. Yeah. Great effort. Um, but yeah, he's res- respected, obviously, at the yeah, club. And uh, good good player, mate. Good player. Should should have played high. Played against him, Youth Cup semi final oh, at St. Wow. James's. He played for Newcastle. And we pumped them um, 4 0. But. He played that night, and I could see he was a quality little player. Right. And uh, so then I followed him, followed his career a bit, and he went Doncaster. And going to play with him when I was 33, we we linked up so well. It was yeah. training was a joy, playing games was a joy, and I I, I actually thought this kid should have played. Oh, yeah. This kid should have played champ for his whole career, yeah. really. Very good. Uh, Gordon Strachan gave me my debut. Um, tough tough school. One one from like the. The I'm tough sure. school, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember giving my debut and said, "Are you a man or a mouse?" I was like, <laughs> "I'm a man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a man, yeah, <laughs> a real boy." Instead of uh, instead of you know bigging you up with that confidence, it was more like, "Are you good enough?" And uh, but no, he's. I seen him in La Manga in the summer actually on our pre-season tour. I had a good chat with him. Yeah. And ended up, I played with Gavin, his son, and ended he ended up being my coach at Doncaster. So, 
know the family well and respect them all, yeah, good people. Big Dealy had Ebola? Dealy, mate, yeah, Dealy was, Dealy was a ledge, wasn't he? He was <laughs> the biggest man ever and we're, I, was only sh I was actually only showing someone the other day in training, I, I mentioned Dealy's name because you've got a big, you know, big lad up front. I said, you don't actually have to do much to, to, to beat someone. Dealy just used to pin, you did. roll, roll pin and roll, yeah. pin and roll. Fire. And as long as you weren't getting around that arm, he was through on goal yeah, or he was. was the other side here. He admitted that himself pre-game at the weekend. Yeah, his Saturday. signature role was to pin, roll to his left, that shift it to his left foot and just it's drill one across. Right, yeah. yeah, but he did, it, it was more of a scuff, not a drill. Yeah, it was, it was. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I remember one day in training at Cov, he was pinning Steve Stoller. <laughs> <laughs> Next thing you know is, Dealy, you big <laughs> Stands on the floor there with a broken jaw. Oh, no. Dealy had pinned him, but Done him. he's that strong. He yeah, just yeah. clicked his jaw out. Yeah. <laughs> he knows own strand big deals. Uh, Rady Jaidi. Uh, Rady, yeah, nice fella, Rady. Used to love used to love a camcorder. He'd have a camcorder. Really? Anywhere. Yeah, honestly. Right and he'd have like a camera phone before they were even invented <laughs> i think he invented them wonder what's, what he's done with them tapes <laughs> lovely lovely guy though yeah lovely guy uh cam jerome cammy like now cam cam was cam was a good lad he was raw wasn't he yeah very powerful good. got a bit better as he got older yeah but lovely lad lovely lad would do, do anything for you and worked his socks off and he's had a great career hasn't he Jermaine main beckford bex was uh bex was just like a goal machine he really was. He was fast. Went from Leeds to Everton, and I, 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 I did think, would he do it in the Prem? But I think that season he scored ten goals in the Prem. Mm. So you know, you can't say he didn't didn't yeah, do yeah. it. And he went on to have a great career and had a great couple of seasons for Leeds. Well. Then a couple of years and good goal scorer. Yeah. Last couple, uh, Peter Reid. Peter Reid. He um, seen him actually last summer in Hong Kong and the Hong Kong Sevens. He's he's a funny guy and. Yeah. Had a couple of stories because he was my manager at Coventry for a bit. Um, for me, personally, under Reedy, he loaned me out to Luton for a month. I went back to Luton once for a month. Weren't quite clicking, but then I come back, and I think that's when Mickey Adams come in, and Adrian Eve, his assistant, was still there, and Inchi was a great coach for me, mm. personally. Played a similar position, and but Reedy, yeah, he, was, he was a good guy, he was funny took us to the races once chucked 500 quid behind the bar for the lads you know yeah, stuff play, like yeah, that little Re things that Re yeah really um a man's man you know yeah. what i mean the, the man, management was, man good. management was good and always always made you feel good gary o'connor finally gas bloody hell got a fair few stories gary o'connor <laughs> yeah sure. do you know what I, I used to get on fire with gas i used to get on fire i used to like him i used to take his stories with a pinch of salt <laughs> yeah <laughs> but um no, he, he was all right and he was a great, he was a good finisher in training, unbelievable. He had unbelievable at that, you know, the curl into the far corner, the whip round the corner into the top corners and stuff, unbelievable finisher. But remember the, when he told the physio, he was, what did he tell the physio? He was getting his tattoos removed and uh, he'd just missed training for one day, come back in with two big scars on his neck, had to miss a month. But the physio just thought he was getting them lasered off. But he actually had surgery. <laughs> <laughs> Physio's expecting him back in, ready he, for the weekend. He'd come in like Frankenstein. <laughs> couldn't, couldn't, move, move. couldn't move his neck like Ronnie Moore. He was like that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, he was out for a month because he had his tattoos removed. But listen, he's, he's, Gaz has had, he's had his problems and that. But when I was with him at Blues, he was a nice lad. And I, I take people how they are with me. And you know, he, my time knowing him and being with him, he was sound. I know your career in football hasn't finished just yet, but like you say, no regrets as you reflect on it all. One or a two, a few, a few what ifs, but yeah, no real regrets. I'd have loved to have scored them two headers to get us the title. <laughs> that that's that game at Preston, but but now you know what, it could be worse, couldn't it? Absolutely. You know, there's there's a lot of players out there that injury didn't make it. You look at the Berry situation now. Mm -hmm people out of work so I have to look back and be grateful 559 career appearances I think it was and uh, yeah I look back on yeah it was good it was good something that I'd I'd love to relive it again yeah. you know have another crack at it but yeah I can't be uh, I can't complain at her yeah. needs to get you back on Blues TV soon come down come down no yeah I will I'll, I'll be down I'll be down as I'll be down as much as I can to be honest yeah yeah, yeah. Down, so. chefs thank you ever so much in this middle of this 
service drive station <laughs> at a drive through of a coffee shop but it's good catching up with you mate thank no you. worries thank you the blues talk podcast with dale moon and callum denning gary mcsheffrey ladies and gentlemen what, what a man Sitting at the side of a service station somewhere on the M1. You know what? I, I mean, when we did Darren Purse in a school in Northampton, I was like, surely we can't get any more yeah, random. random, really, in terms of interview locations. Yeah. But then we did a bit of a wild goose chase around South Yorkshire. <laughs> so we went to Junction 29, found a Starbucks there, which is, you know, where we were told to meet. Mm. McSheffrey rings, where are you? Junction 29A. Yeah. Not Shambles. Great. He still looks like a player in his tracksuit, doesn't he, Chef? Looks after him. He's got it's that like little baby face. Donny Rovers, brand new signer. Yeah, but um, now nah, I've re- really enjoyed talking to him. Actually, we could have um, could have sat there for longer. But great stories about players of yesteryear and blue shirts and blues managers, and not just that, but someone who's I think learnt and looks back in hindsight at some of the mistakes that he made as well. Mm-hmm. And it has the um, I don't know. It has the the nous now and humility to say he wasn't at his best at certain times, not just in a blue shirt, in a sky blue shirt as well. Um, but really interesting to see how he's developed as a kid, uh, being one of the youngest, as we mentioned, that Jude Bellingham is for Blues. Years of age, yeah. You know, in the Premier League to make your your debut against against Villa and as a 16-year-old must have just been a whirlwind for him. And it's really difficult because you try and hammer into like... Um, to young footballers how important it is to to learn and to take it all in but until you actually get older and I think Gary McSheffrey is a great example of a player who until he got older did he probably look back and realise the magnitude of what he's achieved and I know he says there's like one or two little things he regret but he didn't do too bad out the game did he I mean played at the championship played at the highest level with with Carvin Blues and um, yes now still involved in football which is great passing down all of that experience to the next generation. It's my generation as well. McSheffrey in a blue shirt, 2006-07. First season that I properly remember. Mm. Finishing second in the championship. I know he was beating himself up for those two headers at Preston that he missed that could have won us the league. I, I wonder what the Duke thinks of Gary McSheffrey calling him a bit greedy. We need to get him back we on. We will speak to the Duke We'll put about this, this to him and get the Duke's verdict on McSheffrey's comments. He, he, and he kept saying, it's, you know, he releases the ball. So he must have just been holding onto the ball for too long, trying to do it himself. But... His words, not mine. I'm going to speak to Duke and see what he says. Get a bit of dirt on Gary McSheffrey. I think Chefs is claiming a bit of a mentor role there for Duke, by the way. <laughs> Responsible <laughs> yeah. for our three home goals this season, the yeah. headers. Yeah. Anyway, speaking about back post headers, we'll touch on Stoke in a minute. But I'm sorry to do this to you now. Let's go back to the Liberty Stadium. Midday on a Sunday. I mean, Horrible. it's not great at the best of times. No, Grim South, South Wales, early kickoff Sunday. Televised game. What time were you up out of interest? Uh, 5.45. Oh, not bad. <laughs> yeah, it was, it's complain. okay. But you know what? It's um, Again, we go, we go to a Swansea team and you know what Swansea are all about. And yeah, they are a team who've gone through a lot of change. Not not just their players, but also the, the manager as well. But they, like Brentford in a sense, have a philosophy, a way of playing that regardless of who the manager is or what players come in, they have to adhere to that philosophy. And so... I don't think they surprised Blues in any way in the manner that Swansea set up on the day, the way they played. And for a 45 minutes to an hour, it was, a, it was a pretty solid away day performance. We managed to keep them at bay without offering too much of an attacking threat. Um, but we managed to keep them at bay. The one hairy moment being Pedersen's header off the yeah. line. But it was resolute. Yeah, from Jan Dander. But to be fair, they started to frustrate them. I remember sitting in commentary thinking they're getting a little bit restless here. I think one or two balls might have gone out of play or they overhit a pass out for a goal kick. You could hear one or two little groans. You, mm-hmm. As the away team, you're thinking, right, we're, this is exactly where you want to be. And then the breakthrough came and that almost changed the complexity of um, of the game. Then we're forced to come out because we have to score to take anything from the game. So the game plan goes out the window. Um and they just sort of opened us up with the second and third. But again, the big disappointment for Pep, I'm sure, will be the fact that we conceded three goals in 11 minutes. Two, I think two and five, three and yeah. 11. It's quite um, fun. Yeah, and so we just seemed to collapse, whereas we needed to stay in the game at one and see if we could just nick one back ourselves. But yeah, disappointing away day. Uh, you come away and pick the bones out of it, look, take it for what it was, and then um, yeah, kick on to, again, coming back to St Andrews and, and taking on Stoke. Like you said, though, managed to hold the fort almost for 60 minutes. It was almost like set up to be a defensive performance. You know what Swansea are all about. They are going to try and get at you. But like you said, did that for most of the match. Yeah. Just that little 10-minute period. I remember speaking to Pep after, and it was in the run-up to the Stoke game. He said, you know, you can either 
labour on negatives or try and pick positives out of it. And that was one of them. You know, we, we showed against Brentford in the first game of the season that we can be resolute. And again, for an hour against a decent Swansea team who did pose threats. I mean, going forward, they were they were so tricky and mm-hmm. the, the movement was very good. Um, the manner of the goals will be disappointing, but it's all about learning from... The, I mean, Fran Villalba gets shrugged off the ball. And in Spain, I don't think there's a player like... I think Jay Fulton's the one who just barges him. He almost ragdolls him out of the way inside our own half. Whereas in Spain, they probably let you have it and go and retreat. And So it's all a learning experience for those young players. Um and Wes Harding's unfortunate that he gets pushed up the pitch because he's expecting Villalba to play him forward. I think we it's picked the bones out of it, didn't we? Space, yeah, yeah pretty much. And then Selena can obviously exploit exploit that space. So things to learn from. Uh, and like we say, you never want to lose a game, but as long as you you learn from the experience and make sure it don't happen again. Time will tell when we go away from home again how we set up and how we how we deal with it. But those um, those performances seem to be a world away from from what we saw in the last 20 minutes, at least, against Stoke City. Third goal, penalty for Swansea. Mark Roberts gave it away. I just want to touch on Robbo. Because, I mean, aside from that, what a season he's been having. Unbelievable. Running the first team, which has been long overdue. You know what? I think it shows you just how much confidence can play a part. There will be people that will always hammer Robbo, and he knows it himself. And Lee Camp gets the same sort of treatment early on. Um, But his performances have to do the talking. There is no other way of winning people round than making sure that your performances are good. And this season, yeah, we've conceded some goals, like heavy defeats on the road. But um, Robbo, I think, has been as good as I've seen him uh, since he joined the clubs. Definitely as well, on that note. Well, well, the the biggest compliment you can pay to Campy is no one's talking about him. Exactly. Well, there'll be always people that'll that'll criticise Campy just because he's... He'll throw one in and then pluck one out the top corner. It's the sort of goalkeeper he is. He knows that himself. Um, but for Robbo, it's just good to see a player who's a smashing lad off the pitch, um, get a run in the team, watch his confidence grow. Uh, and actually, if you took it in isolation, some of his defending this year has been very, very good. It's just a pity that we've been on the end of a few heavy defeats. So you can't... You know, so, certain score lines, you can't come out and say... How good was he to that? Well, how can he? How can he have played? Yeah. Right, you've just lo- you've just conceded three goals. You can't s- highlight a centre half. I've been impressed with Robbo. Hopefully, he kicks on now and just enjoys this run. Gets better and better. Grows into the the position and the role because um, yeah, smashing that off the pitch and a good laugh as well. Right. Well, on to Stoke here at the St Andrews Trillion Trophy Stadium. Not been a happy hunting ground for Stoke, as you said in your uh, pre-match on Blues TV. Yeah, <laughs> talking of pre-match on oh, Blues here we go. TV. Go on. <laughs> So I forgot who our co-commentator was, didn't I, like uh... Hang on, let's My rewind this. You didn't just forget, you decided to throw it a genuine so blues poor. legend under the bus. Yeah, me and Dealey were in the studio, obviously, for anyone who hasn't seen it. <laughs> so we've done our pre-match build-up half hour, 20 minutes, let's say, of looking at Stoke and how we can get at them. And we throw to our commentary team as the, the players are coming out of the tunnel. So Darren Purse was our co-commentator, but I hadn't, he, he had to arrive late. So I didn't actually meet Percy on the day. Usually I would meet him in and see how they're getting on, have a little catch Get up. Get a cup of tea. Yeah, but because he was late coming from one of his coaching, he games he's coached, um, one of the teams he coaches. Uh, he QPR away. I didn't so see great him, effort, yeah. By the way. Yeah. Um, so I've just had a complete mind blank. So my words were, let's go to our commentary team, Jonathan Bell. And uh, then pure panic comes over my mind. Turn to Dealey. Who is it again? I've killed Dealey because he has no idea what I'm talking about. So he's looking at me and he mouths like, I don't know, like keeps his lips still as he can. So he's now a rabbit in the headlights and I just have to sort of make a laugh of it and and say uh, Jonathan Bell and, and laugh and somebody else. Tell you what, though, Not my finest moment on It telling. wasn't as bad as you made it out to be. I mean, have a listen to this. Talking you through it, our commentary team, Jonathan Bell and uh, oh, who's alongside him? <laughs> Jonathan Bell and someone else. Yeah, thanks, mate. Yeah, you, you, you got away with it. Yeah, no, it's okay. We just, you just have to, one of those things where you just have to smile at it in hindsight. But one thing's for sure, I'll be writing down who our co-commentator is for every game this season. Big, big letters behind see, the camera. See, I, I, can't, I can't preach that a team have got to learn from defeats if I'm not learning from a defeat. So I've took the L and now I'm moving on. This is it. We're all about learning yeah. from those minor setbacks. <clears throat> As for the game itself, um, you're right, wasn't a happy hunting ground for Stoke. I think it was one win in 12. Um, and in those 12, we'd kept 10 clean sheets. Yeah. I mean, that's an unbelievable... Talk about defending. That's an unbelievable stat. Um, 10 clean sheets out of 12 against Stoke. We didn't manage to preserve that or extend that record on the day. Um, 
another scrappy game, wasn't it, for an hour? Let's not kid ourselves. It was they they added to what was a bitty game, and so too did the referee. Yeah. Um, every little thing was getting blown up. We stopped any momentum. We couldn't. Do get you want the... to talk about the Jimenez incident? Yeah, well, uh, you know what's interesting with that one. Uh, Darren Purse and Jonathan Bell were screaming penalty in real time, and we were watching it on Blues TV, and we weren't sure initially whether. It, you know, there was too much contact when the arms went over the shoulder, if he did have a pull on his shoulder or if he went to ground. I think having the benefit of seeing it two or three times, not only does is there enough there to warrant a penalty, but he does obviously tread on his face and leaves him with Alvaro with a few nasty scratches by the eye and the ear and the cheek. As and... Alvaro was happy to post on Instagram the <laughs> next morning. Yeah, uh, he's proud, isn't he, really? Now he feels That's like he's in England, yeah. And Pep, actually, I have to say, Pep's response to this post-game was brilliant because... You know, he was he weren't in as many words telling Alvaro welcome to English football, but he did say in as many words, you can expect more of this. This is a real welcome. You got to do. You got to get. get. You've got to get more than failed than that to um to get a penalty. You're not going to get a penalty just for being pulled down to the floor and stamped on your face almost. So he took it really well. Um, so yeah, we didn't get that decision, and then Stoke scored. Don't I mean they? It's a fantastic delivery from wide. <clears throat> Gets straight through though, doesn't it, to Lindsay? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's one of those horrible ones to deal with because the defenders are running back towards their own goal. Lee Camp thinks that it's it's bending away from him, so he retreats then and backpedals onto his own onto his own line, and then really it's food and drink for him at the back post to nod it home. And then you think, well, you're staring down the barrel. You've just been done three 0 away from home. Could the atmosphere turn? And credit to the supporters, actually, they stuck with Blues. You know, you sometimes you get the feeling that supporters. Not the Blues are particularly bad at this, but you know when the atmosphere is turning, I talked yeah. about Swansea, they get frustrated, the natives at home. I didn't sense that at least. And it probably is to do with the fact that Blues hit back relatively quickly, which was a big help. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, Lukas Jukovic, isn't it? It's another one that you can add to his show reel of how to head a ball. I, mean, I was going to talk about how the match was incredibly similar to the Barnsley uh, win. But that goal, I think, just emphasised it. Yeah. Yeah, you hang one up with that. And I think a lot of people pointed out it was the first time that Maxim kind of got that high up the pitch yeah. in the game. Uh, he obviously came back into the team. And he makes a massive difference. I mean, Wes is a fantastic young prospect. And it's just unfortunate that he is beyond one of the better right backs in this division. One um, of the most underrated players in the division as a whole. Just consistent. I mean, he defends well. He gets forward when he can. He links up well. Um and he did for the goal. He just stands it up. And I don't even think players now have to look because you know he's going to be there. And uh, this time it's a header, uh, a header down into the ground and up into the roof of the net. And um, that really was the... I know what happened next takes the headlines. But that was the most important goal because it prevented a, a scenario where it was turning a little bit. And um, it meant that we now were the team in the ascendancy back on level terms. And isn't it mad to think that if we'd have taken the lead in that game and conceded, Stoke would have fancied their chances to go on, wouldn't it? Absolutely. But because we concede first and get back to one apiece, it's then us that are, are taking the game to Stoke. And credit to and a big shout out to Dan Crowley as well. What an impact! Changed the game. Yeah, what an impact! You know, he was dropped for a couple of games. Was it just the one game? I think the one, yeah. was it. Yeah, he's taken out the team. Um, comes back in with twenty minutes to play, and he's just busy scattering around the pitch. Wants the ball, lends it to him, gives it someone back, tries to get Blues uh, moving and up the pitch, um, links up with with Lukas Jukovic, with the players around him. There was just a real energy and determination in Dan Crowley's play to try and win that game for Blues. Um, and I don't think that should be overlooked. Um, but it was because ultimately we have a 16-year-old who can't stay out the headlines for all the right reasons at the minute. Let's talk about Jefferson Montero before we come on to uh, his replacement. Mm. Full start at home, absolutely wounding Sim, get that injury. Yeah, and really innocuous looking one as well. Um, where we are in the Gilmerick studio behind the away fans mm-hmm. has a perfect view of the incident and it didn't look like there was too much contact. You just felt like he was probably trying to go down to win a free kick, probably felt a little bit, has gone down. So that incensed the Stoke City fans, so we're expecting to get up and then he doesn't get up for a bit, so you think, OK, he's, he's really going to milk this one and maybe get a bit of treatment. So he does, but then the stretcher's called on. You think, well, clearly it's more serious than than we thought. Later learned that it was obviously a quad problem, felt it ping. So it's not great. You know, As we talk and record here, we don't know what the update is on Jefferson Montero, but it wasn't great news. Just seeing him stretch it off uh, and post-game, 
um, it didn't look fantastic. So we await to hear what the official diagnosis is with him. But you know, we were we were crying out for pace and someone to get us up the pitch. And after what twenty minutes, half an hour, yeah. was it longer? I, I can't remember what stage it was. But half an hour, I think. Um, yeah, it is is uh, his his first appearance, a start at least in a blue shirt, uh, ends in disaster. So hopefully he gets a speedy recovery and getting back in because I think a fit and fire in Jefferson Montero makes Blues a completely different team. Absolutely. So Jefferson Montero taken off on a stretcher, replaced uh, by a young man by the name of Jude Bellingham. Yeah, I don't know if you've heard of him, Calf. Name rings a bell. I He's think, got a little but... bit, I think. Um, yeah, I mean that and that gives everyone a lift. You see. 16-year-old lad from the area. He's been at the academy since pre-academy, so seven, six, seven years old. Um, gets his debut, the youngest ever player uh, in not just the League Cup, but then in the league when he comes on and now the youngest ever goal scorer. And it opened up for him nicely. I didn't think he wanted to shoot at one stage. I think, uh, well, initially, actually, he drifts past a player. He ghosts uh-huh. around a player and you think... Oh, okay. He can, he's got a shift in him as well. Cause I think in the last year, physically, he's developed Jude. I was mm-hmm. talking to Colin Tatum about this today. But a year ago, I don't think he had the power in his legs to burst past a player who'd be in the chat. I don't know how slow or fast the midfielder was, but he just had a little change of pace, a little burst around the outside of a defender and um, a midfielder. Sorry. And we thought, oh, okay, it may just sit up a little bit. He's got that in his locker as well as all the other tools in his armoury. And... Um, and then a few minutes later, he was chasing back and showed real athleticism to try and help out over on that right-hand side where he was asked to do a job. Um, and then he finds himself in a central position. I think um, it opens up for him, and he's first. To, he's looking. You can see he's trying to slot someone through because that, I think that's the way Jude. That's where Jude's at his best. The edge of the 18-yard box, provider where he can either find that little pass or he'll chop away from a defender. You watch how many times, whether it's 23s football or first team this year. He'll chop from left to right and leave defenders sliding past um, because that's where I think uh, Jude's at his best. So he finds himself in a similar position now because it's his first game at St Andrews. There is, I think he was accused in the nicest possible way after the game of being too safe, actually, because he, you're probably a bit nervous. You want to make sure that first pass is a good one. So when you, there is space in front of you, I'd rather give it to somebody yeah. else and, and just play the simple game. Whereas his talent's so much more than that. So I don't, you know, we scratch the surface of Jude Bellingham at the weekend. But that one occasion where uh, he didn't pass because he realised he had a good five yards in front of him, scuffs his shot horribly wrong. I mean, he drags it. I think it's either, going, he said it's going straight towards the goalkeeper, but at the slowest rate of knots you've ever seen. Yeah. Uh, and because everything he touches at the minute turns to gold, it gets that deflection. It's the Tilton, mate. Spins into the far corner. Um, on his bottom. <laughs> I, it got me off my seat. I remember watching it alongside Dealey. And uh, the away crowd in front of us went dead silent. We've jumped up, banged the glass. And <laughs> you forget where you are a second because you're just elated for the boy, for yeah. the club, for Pep, for the result. Um, and the scenes afterwards. I mean, I don't know what your view was of it, but fantastic to uh, see that. Scenes were very similar to your own, I think. In the corner of St Andrews, where I am, I was bouncing around the room. I think I jumped on about three people up there. Yeah. Yeah. I had a good view of uh, the Tilton, just limbs everywhere, I think. But can you imagine, you've just hit the winner, though we didn't know it at the time. You've ran towards the Tilton. I don't condone fans on the pitch, but it was just the chaos of it all. The pandemonium in the Tilton. Elation. Just adds to it all, don't it? Um, so I would give so much to have experienced what he did on the day to run towards that and celebrate with the fans and it was just, must just you must just be on top of the world and I'm sure he didn't sleep too much that night too young to go out as me and yeah. Dealey were talking about so he couldn't have a Had drink a and he couldn't zero. go out <laughs> yeah um, but he's the sort of kid and everyone has listened to his post-match comments on Blues TV and local radio as well um, what a mature head mm. on, on 16 year old shoulders I mean spoke eloquently it was all about enjoying the moment and uh, enjoying being mobbed by the Tilton Road end, but also how it makes him hungry for, hungry for more. And I think he's had to have that attitude since he was a young kid. He's, he's been the worst kept secret at this football club um, because of his involvement with England and how well he's excelled at the academy and playing various age groups up. Um, so everyone's known about Jude Bellingham. And when you're told as a kid how good you are, you could be easily drawn into resting on your laurels, cruising a little bit, thinking you're the next best thing. You don't sense an ounce of that in Jude Bellingham. The most level-headed kid. 
you will ever meet. And I think that's the biggest compliment. Not how good he is as a footballer, because we can all see how he could potentially go on to be a fantastic player. But just the um, the maturity in the kid at 16 is astounding. And I think he's a credit to to the football club and all the coaches that have worked with him, his family that have brought him up the way he has and to himself. So I don't want to put too much um, more emphasis on Jude Bellingham. The club have obviously played it down as much as they can because he is still a boy. Um, but he'll be chomping at the bit now for more first team appearances and it's up to Pep. How do you... I mean, they'll be clambering, they'll be calling for, for Jude to be in, but it's up to Pep, of course, to get the blend right. And with young lads like that, you want to make sure the conditions are right. You don't want to kill his confidence. You don't want to put him in an awkward... Too much too soon. Yeah, in, in horrible circumstances. So that's the big challenge for Pep. I'm glad it's his challenge and not mine because you know what? He, he, the ability um, the ability he's got in those boots, but at the same time, you have to be wary that he's still just 16, just turned 16 years mm-hmm. old. So it'll be interesting to see in the coming weeks and games uh, how they utilise him. Think about how you answer this. What were you doing at 16? At 16 years old... What was that? He so he's just got his GCSE results. Just, yeah, matter of weeks ago. Yeah, so um, I'd have, I'd have, yeah, I'd have been gearing up for a scholarship at League One Warsaw. So it's yeah, unfortunately I was nowhere near as good as Jude Bellingham was, but um, yeah, I'd have got my, I'd have probably been with my mates, um, telling them how great I was, <laughs> and look where that got me. <laughs> <laughs> so stay mature, Jude Bellingham. Stay grounded. Um, but no, what, was you doing story at, of what was you doing at what was you doing at sixteen years old? I was just trying to think, I cannot remember, so I can't clearly have just, been. You just finished year eleven at school. I, I was just moving into college to uh, go into the glitzy world of the media. Go nice. and study media at college. Nice. Not scoring in front of the Tilton Road end. Uh, no, it's worlds away from us. I'd gladly swap. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, credit to him. So yeah, let's um, watch this space. But just, and I'm sure Blues fans will. Be mindful that he's still a 16-year-old kid and you can't expect too soon, too much too soon. Well, we'll talk about our trip to Charlton, heading down to South London in just a moment. But the Barclays Women's Super League starts again this Sunday. Blues taking on Everton. How better to mark that occasion by speaking to one of the new faces through the door at Blues this season. Brie Vasali. The Blues Talk Podcast. What music do you listen to before a game? Rap. Uh, Snapchat story or Instagram stories? Insta. Which country produces the best food? Italy. Mm. Ideal holiday destination? Um, Barcelona. Favourite TV series? Wait, can I take that back? Hawaii. Oh, Hawaii. Sorry. Okay. Favourite TV series? Mindhunter. Okay, I've heard it's good. good. Uh, What would you order from a coffee shop? Um, Typically a pour over or drip coffee filter. Okay. What did you go dressed as to your last fancy dress party? Fancy dress party? What is that supposed to be? You know mean? when you get dressed up like for Halloween or for oh. like, you dress as a character, like a costume? I was a hot dog. Oh. <laughs> Actually, wait, no, I was mini me and my friend was Dr. Evil. That would look amazing. <laughs> that would look good. Uh, NBA, NFL, Major League Baseball, do you follow a team or don't you care? MLB. Which team? Giants, San Francisco Giants. Okay. One person dead or alive you'd invite round for dinner? Mother Teresa. Oh. Can you speak another language? Yes. Language? Spanish. Mm. And a little Italian. Oh, impressive. If the whole squad had a Royal Rumble, who would be left in the ring at the end? Rachel. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even have to think no. about it. Uh, if you could be a nationality other than your own, what would it be? Mm. I don't know. I don't know. I don't really care too much yeah. about it. What are the names of the pets that you or your family have owned? Um, Molly, Sophie, uh, Zoe, Coco, Olive. You got a zoo. Oh, are they like <laughs> alive? No, no, they don't have to be. Oh, okay. And then Dot. Are they all dogs? Yeah. Oh, cute. We don't mess uh, with cats. <laughs> Same. Most played song or album ever? Oh, probably G E Z. Um, his first album. G E Z. Yeah, it's random. Well, he's from the Bay, so. Yeah, yeah fair. Just repping locally. Yeah. Uh, have you got any tattoos? No. What type of student were you at school? Like a 4.0, <laughs> which is like a straight A student, <laughs> I guess. It? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Use a class geek. That's good. You should be proud of that. That's fine. Yeah. Good. Uh, <laughs> what's the strangest thing you've eaten? Oh, um, either baby pig or horse meat this summer when I was in Italy. What's horse meat like? 
just kind of like a little gamier, but like just like beef. Uh, what's on? I ate crocodile. So you've eaten quite. That is exotic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> what? Uh, it's American. It's not that exotic. No, it is here. Okay. What's uh, on your bucket list? What? What do you want to do before you die? Hmm. Wow, this is a little too deep for me. Yeah. Um, scuba dive. Live in a beach house. My life. The rest of my life. <laughs> Basic. Are you addicted to anything at all? Probably working out in coffee. Are you? Like, act- if I'm being honest. At separate times. I mean, the same time would be. I could. I would prefer <laughs> to have my could. coffee on the sideline. Fair. Um, so if anyone's looking for a coffee <laughs> sponsorship, yeah. call me. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what are you most afraid of? Clowns. Oh, really? I don't like them. Have you seen It? No. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, but you don't like clowns? Yeah, that's the whole point. So it's actually like a really good, oh, okay. scary movie. True. Um, what's your favourite city in the world other than your hometown? Ah, you was going to go to the hometown straight away. Uh, Malibu, oh, okay. where I went to college. Nice. Um, the best way to eat chicken. So what part of the chicken are your legs, breast, wing, thigh, and what flavour? Definitely like thigh, leg combo. Okay. Uh, no breast, unless you don't like you like dry meat like Always what's breast. wrong yeah, with you yeah but you can have it marinated okay so you're anti-breast anti-breast I'm not a breast woman Ray anti-breast no breast woman here <laughs> um definitely bacon or barbecue but like it has to be slow cooked so it falls oh, okay. off the bone okay so it's like tender yeah nice uh, last for you what's your thoughts on fishing and people who fish love them all my friends fish <laughs> I used to date a fisherman <laughs> <laughs> he had his own boat <laughs> You learn something new. Oh, my (laughs) Jesus. Uh, That's not the answer we get every time we do this quiz. Uh, Have you got any memorabilia? Everyone hates fishing. It's boring. You sit there for hours and don't do anything. Yeah, you get a buzz. No, you never get a buzz. It's called catching. You You never get a buzz. (laughs) Um, Have you got any memorabilia? So, like, any sporting memorabilia? Have you collected anything or anything you've kept? Uh, My first professional jersey with the FA Cup stitching on it and it's framed my parents framed it put their man cave but yeah nice and the last question have you ever read a book cover to cover and what book loads like which one you are a 4.0 student I know um what was the most recent one The Sinner The Sinner Mm mhm Tess Grittesson can't really pronounce she's The Blues Talk Podcast with Dale Moon and Callum Denning I always wondered Dale what's the uh you know on the topic of the quick fire questions what's the weirdest fancy dress item that you've ever worn it's uni- she, she, university usually so Toy Story from uh, Woody from Toy Story we dressed up as a cowboy we had a cowboy's fancy dress last year I'm not one for fancy dress to be fair I'm no, miserable I'm, like, I'm really miserable like that it sounds horrendous but I'm not in for um, I'm not one for fancy dress so I can't remember too often I don't know it's a big it used to be a huge thing with the with the footballers with their Christmas party it's always fancy dress you know you see the the lads, don't you? The um... was it Bez Labala last season who went as himself to the fancy dress? Well, he party? pulls the card. So yeah, they draw a card to see who goes as yourself. So that's like the short straw. Yeah. So yeah, Bez uh, firing at Crawley, by the way. Yeah, scoring very goals well. at Crawley. Credit to him. Uh, yeah, Bez pulled the short straw and had to go as himself. But yeah, have you gone as many many dodgy fancy dress outfits? There's only one. Alan Partridge. That is ledge. Radio hero. Did you just put a suit on. It had to be like the most. Yanan pullover you could oh, find. Okay. Alan Partridge mask. I think I even got, I ordered it off Amazon, like a Radio Norwich t shirt to wear underneath to go like the full commitment. Decent. And I think I've done, I, I'm with you, I'm not one for fancy dress. I know, it sounds really miserable, We'd but I'd be rather awful get dressed taking up on these out. questions. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, not, uh, she, to be fair to, um, to be fair to Bree, she had some good answers, didn't she? A bit of American. Not having the fishing one. I know. I know but, but, this is the difference. We're not talking about Chardin Lake by me. I it's mean, she's talking California. about... Yeah. <laughs> so it's probably a little bit different. Yeah, um, just a bit. So that's why her opinion skewed. But yeah, fish is not for me either. Boring. Right. Well, you've got the chance to see Brie Vasali in action. Her first game for Blues. In the first WSL game of the season, Blues hosting Everton on Sunday. Kickoff is at two. If you haven't been down to the malls, by the way, for one of these matches, absolutely incredible. Recommend it to you. Really big family occasion, Dale. Won't even recognise the stadium because obviously all the changes oh, yeah, have been brand going new. on. Yeah, as well. But yeah, get behind the girls. All changes, isn't it? Lots of players in, lots of players out. So it's a completely new blue squad. They'll need all the support they can get this season. Get yourselves down there. It's always a great occasion. 
Um, and like you say, good family atmosphere down there for Blues women. So, yeah, cheer on uh, Marta's team against Everton. Well, hopefully we'll be getting down there as well at some point this season to provide you with a Blues talk from the Moors. Yeah, that'd be good, wouldn't it? Yeah, a bit of a different one. So we'll see how, uh, yeah, we'll see how they get on. Well, back onto the men's team. They are away at Cholton. We've got a bit of an international break now. So we've got, what, we're Friday now, so a week tomorrow till we're back in league action. Yeah. Good yep. ground, Charlton. Happy hunting ground as well. Federico Makeda, I seem to remember getting two down there. Do Gary's flick. One of Christoph the greatest Christoph blues Dugar- goals of all time. That is the place we're starting. Le Doug. <laughs> Christoph Dugary's nonchalant flick into the corner. Uh, and I think he just stood there, arms aloft in front of the away support, I think. Um, yeah, somewhere we haven't been. Uh, with Blues I haven't been with Blues for a couple of seasons now never uh, been no I've been as a supporter never as a never as a yeah, working been in the away end. so um, yeah, it's a nightmare to get to but credit to him Lee Bowyer's side I mean f- absolutely flying the surprise package of these early few weeks of the championship in the league as it stands um, yeah I mean from our side the players have been given a few days off come back in this week late this week um, and we'll just have a full week's preparation next week to go into Charlton uh, and then obviously Preston, um, but yeah, good to see where we. Are. I mean, it's good just at this first international break to have ten points on the board. Uh, I think it just gives Pep, the team, the club a little bit of leeway to work with now. Try and get the performances right. Put a lot of work in on the training ground next week. Um, looking forward to the Charlton game, but make no mistake. I mean, don't overlook Ch- this Charlton team. I think there's been a few in the last few weeks that have done that at their peril. So. Um, Stoke being one of them. Yeah, well, it'd be, be a very tough game for us. And as we say, the away form is the one that Blues have to try and improve now. So be interesting to see the lineup, who's available, because of course there's one or two that are creeping back towards fitness now. Whether Jack McGoham is back, Kerry Morabti was on the bench against Stokes. So good to see he, him as an option. Chet Cater for the 23s yeah. was an absolute revelation. Uh, played Could have wide. Had a penalty, shouldn't he? Yeah, it was a stone wall penalty. I mean, it got done for diving, but we were right in front of it. It's a penalty all day long. Um, unlike another high profile penalty decision. Uh, no comment, Your Honour. But Jack Grealish, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Chet Cater, um, yeah, Im- Im- just impressed from the off. And so I think he, he, I think he had an hour against Ipswich at Wast Hills, done well. So he'll, you know, when we ask Pep about it, he's an option for him. And in the system, Maybe one that he'll have a look at. We don't know. So we'll wait and see what um, the team selection looks like. But tough game at the Valley. Well, the next time you hear from us, we will be fresh from our trip to the Valley and looking forward to the visit of Preston here to the St. Andrews Australian Trophy Stadium. But until then, I've been Callum Denning. And I've been Dal Moon. And this has been Blues Talk.